doing beers for Bravo. What I'm going to do is talk to you about some of the things that I've used to make this, the sculptures for this book, Beers for Bravo. What strikes me about 100 years of aviation is that um, Australians made do with what there was and they so solved problems of covering distance with frail and flimsy aircraft by using things that was available and that's what I've done. The sorts of materials I've been using for Bravo are things that anybody could use. I'm just going to duck out a camera. And the sorts, sorts of things that I'll be talking to you about are balsa wood. People have been using it for aircraft for ages because it's just so soft and easy to carve. It's a beautiful material. You can even push things in it to mould it. But I'll show you how I use that in a minute. Sheep balsa wood, which I haven't used, but you can see that it's got sort of great properties. See that? It's like, it's just terrific. Look at that, it curves. It's strong, it's very light. If you put that out in the wind, it'll just blow away. It's wonderful stuff. Very much like planes themselves. And you can see by this piece of wood here, I've been carving into it. Look at it. It's just been hacked up for something chronic. See, there's holes in it. I've carved holes in it. I've done all sorts of things. And that's what I've been using to shape the bits. Some of the bits I want to talk to you about. Well, here's a diorama. This might be a good thing to show you because I can hold it right up to the camera. With stuff like box foam like this, have a look at it. It's your typical foam that you get from fruit, from um, vegetable boxes. It's dangerous because you can breathe it in and it has very fine particles. See that? Now I've been cutting that up using um, a very basic carving knife, kitchen carving knife. But the best thing for shaping is, um, it's a scalpel. Very sharp. Um, I have a whole set of brushes of different sizes. Very important, but the first things are the carving things. Basically, it's just knives. And here's one of the scenes. Look, recycling's a big part of this book. Everything I do, I recycle. Um, what you might see here is a daggy bit of um stuff. Oh, great. Well, let's go for a wide shot. See the board in the back? I've been using that board for, um, I've used that board for other stuff. Now, here's one of the diorama scenes. And what you can see is... See that? It's just amazing. See how you're getting that cliff face and with the lighting it's starting to look real, but basically it's just box foam or the stuff you'd use for packing. Now what we do is with a diorama is, what you can see is edge shadows here. What we try and do is get rid of these sorts of things. And just like in studios for TV, what they do is they get a curved backdrop so that the lighting goes soft and the sharp corners are not apparent anymore. So. What I'm going to be doing is I'll be putting a background in like that and that'll be painted the colour of the sky. Let me take it right up to you is probably the best way I'll get that. That's how you'll be seeing this. Why am I showing you this? Well, this is the backdrop, basic backdrop. You can see a bit of tape there. I haven't quite worked that background out yet. There's another piece. Now look at that. That's the back of a piece. It's strutted. That's going to form one of the background mountains. So that'll go in there. That'll be the mountain range in the background. And what's going to be in this picture? Well, look at this guy. There's his eye popped out. He's a little pterodactyl with a hair on his nose. I'll just forget the hairs for a moment. So that's him. Look at that. Now. What you might see is, if I show you the back of him, he's been carved out of balsa wood. You can see the inside of that leg there, but what you'll see is, you'll see him only from one angle, it'll be like this, hang on. Like this, you'll see him from the bottom. Let me get a backdrop there. See him there? And I'm working on his arm there, so he's been carved out of wood, pinned and socketed. And he's our little flying guy, so he's going to be sort of cruising up over the cliff. Now I'll show you that together. What we get is, you get cliff, you get little flying guy like this leaping off the cliff because I was thinking, God, look how, think about how old big things were that flew. Like this thing is, you know, like millions of years old. 
So just after the Jurassic era, you have these things flapping around. Well, flapping, they're not sure because basically they don't have the sort of muscles here that a bird has. Look how flat that chest is. See, that? See how flat that chest is? Birds have very deep chests, but they do have great big wings. The curious thing about um, pterosaurs are that they have, this is the arm, just like we have an arm. See this piece here? But this here is the hand. Four claws stick off the arm front as a gripping mechanism. And along here, this is a finger bone. Do you believe that? That long length is a single finger bone. There's no struts bracing the wings, just like a bat. They just have a skin of a film of skin going out over the body. And that curves according to the shape of the wing. And it, and it suggested that they might have, you know, they, they, they glided, they glide, looking for wind currents. So he's um, the pterosaur. But there's little bits to get sort of sharp detail, like on the nose, see how he's got that nose panel there? Or that nose sail? That's been made out of pieces of shirt box and I'll show you what that looks like. Let's get a look at the side of his head. There he is, happy little guy. He hasn't got an eyelid yet and he hasn't got his arm muscles in, but you can sort of see him kind of doing the stuff, can't you? There you go. Now I'll share the shirt box stuff called acetate. It's funny how it used to be used as shirt box packaging. Now it's packaging for computers and stuff. See that? Give you a backdrop. See that? What I do is I, I mark out the pieces I need because I can see through it just like tracing paper and then I cut it. But the other things you can make from it are amazing because if you heat it, it's soft. Oop, I'm back here. If you heat it, it's soft and you can mould it. I'll show you something else. This is the canopy of a jet fighter. I'll show you the two parts of it. What we have is the plug or the shape. There you go. Let's take it from that side so you're getting some light. That's the canopy carved out of balsa wood and stuck onto a plug. What I do is I get a flat piece of this stuff, the acetate, two chunks of the flat stuff, fold it over, put it down. Heat it over a candle flame. See, there's the mould. There's the mould. This fits through there. It doesn't go that way, it goes that way then. That fits through there. You might be able to see that. Now what I do is, put the acetate underneath. Underneath. Heat that with a candle flame. Ah, voila, candle. Light candle, there you go, candle, light candle, until this gets warm, under there, oh, under there. Once that's warm, this is in a clamp, and I'll push that down over there, push that down there, so that the canopy goes through there with the um, acetate on it, and I get one of these. Have a look at I get one of these, a beautiful canopy. So that's a canopy to a jet fighter made out of an old shirt box. That's carved to fit onto here. As you can see, here's our fighter taking shape, but only from the front. You can see that guy sort of like hanging in there, but have a look at the back of him. It's really quite hideous. There's balsa wood, bits of foam, body filler, all plugged up. But now when we look at it from the right angle, which is from there, you can see it all coming together. He's flying in towards us. You can even see the pilot in there. But the canopy goes on top of there, moulded from that jet fighter and canopy. I'm still working on that, so that's going to be, um, oops, drop me bird man. So kind of looking at that sort of view, it's going to wing over. Hopefully we'll get to see the pilot inside that cockpit. I don't know. I'll have to make sure that's lit properly. So it's coming towards you. See that? 
can see that sort of get that sort of feeling of this thing cruising in towards you very slowly winging over so yeah it's got sort of it's got a good feel of reality about it there you go like that see the wing fences but if you look at them at the top they've been built in perspective so there you go so it doesn't work from the side at all see how it's too short but it works from the front and that's the angle we're looking at something like this coming at you have to cut those wings down it's going to be flying over the top of another plane but um it's about the canopy so there it is that small canopy it looks looks quite good the light you can see it best when the light hits it the lovely things we're talking about foam shaping most of the tools I'm using are very very basic apart from the scalpels let me show you what happens when you put color on these things so we have the basic foam or balsa wood. I love the way these things chip up. What I'm using is I'm using a lot of saws, so let's have a look at that. See that stuff? Coarse, but very light. My trusty old saw, voila. It's very small, it's about the size of my hand, I guess. Look at that. But um, it's got interchangeable blades, which are necessary. Good stuff. Now look what happens when you take that and you put paint on it. So I'll show you, show you the basis here. This is the end view of the book. Now look, once again, balsa wood glued together to form a plug. See these chunks? Now watch what happens when we bring it round and we see it there you go with the paint on it isn't that amazing don't you reckon that's amazing look at the guns on the top uh, gun schmuns but it's interesting because um, the development of weaponry and aircraft was really quick after planes began to fly people could see that they could cover enormous distance and they could take weapons and tactical force to the enemy so that's that's an amazing thing isn't it but yeah once again it's just a plug of wood stuck on a bit of um a bit of foam cardboard now let's have a look that's nothing in itself but once you start to put a present uh, a human figure in there look at this this guy's been carved he's got molded goggles just like we're doing the cockpit He's got his scarf. Now let's pop him in that cockpit and see how it looks together. Kind of see him. Whoa. The thing about tactical air fighting was the danger was always from behind. As a plane became faster or hit in a cloud, that was when the danger was. So these pilots were constantly looking over their shoulders. They had rear view mirrors. Might have been the first real use of the rear view mirror apart from cars maybe, but I think it was much more important in planes. So what I do is I'll pop this guy in here and what happens is we get something that's kind of not real to something that's looking a whole lot more real. Check him out. He's flying along, dodging over his shoulder, wondering what the hell that thing is in that dark shape over the sun. You might also notice the bright motives painted on him. The German pilots were becoming so, so good with these planes, these are these planes which were relatively advanced, they didn't worry about camouflage anymore. They actually wanted people to find them. So they were painted brightly and they had all sorts of things like Knights of the Air, they were often called. They had devices like, um, that was the symbol of a hometown. Look at that, the Edelweiss. So I guess it's kind of romantic, but these people were seriously shooting each other down and it was a terrible death because these things were made of wood and they had petroleum in them and they'd blaze as they fell towards the earth, fanned by the wind. So it was a horrible way to die. So it was with good reason that these people looked around constantly. Mm, you can kind of see that. Now look at this, um, here's a wing. Look at this, I've been experimenting with this wing because that's of that plane we were talking about. Can you see the cross is distorted? That shape on the top's a radiator made out of a piece of shirt box plastic has the header tank but um, it's got the um, 
the header tank. Now what I have to do is, and the actuator for the aileron, which is the control that goes up and down here, see this thing? On the tip of the wing goes up and down and causes the plane to bank and turn. But that's been cut out there, see that? There's the actuator rod there, just sticking up over the wing, see there? Okay. Now, what I have to do is work out the correct angle because this isn't in scale anymore. All the parts are different because it works in perspective. What I have to do is work out how to get that wing sitting on top of there because see how there's a cut out above the wing so that the guy could see because I'm constantly trying to see what was happening. So I'm just going to put that wing in there so it'll be in perspective. It's about a third of the width that it should be. Maybe a quarter. The span of it would be much, much greater. But I'm hoping to see it at such a sharp angle you won't notice so we can look under the wings because that was one of the experiences of flying in a plane like this was having being caught under that wing the lighting's not very good but you kind of get the feeling of sort of zooming in on this guy who's bucking and weaving and trying to get out of your way yeah anyway so amazing what you can do with some bits of wood you might have a look at this wing when you're shaping things with balsa wood like to get a sharp curve like that, that's called an aerofoil. The aerofoil causes lift by getting the air to separate as it, as it flows over the surface. It goes, the air going over the top of the wing goes faster than the air going underneath, which creates a, a pressure difference and lifts that wing up. And you can see that shape, I've exaggerated that in the carving, I'd say. But if you look underneath, you can see the splits. You might see the, see the split lines there, here and here. So I've got that curvature in the wing by cutting down the piece of balsa wood, shaving it and then joining it so it becomes an arc. And that's the wing shape, the aerofoil shape. Probably a bit too sharp. I mean, the, I've made the curve much too great. It should be flatter. But nonetheless, curved at the top, greater curve at the top than the bottom. And that creates lift. And that's the principle of flight. So they're the things I'm going to be talking about, how to be using materials that you might find around the house, cardboard, those foams, and shaping them using simple sorts of carving tools like um, small saws, even kitchen knives. I've got a kitchen knife, I'll show you in a second. Okay, so back to the um, back to the Hitchcock phrase. Look at this, this is a horrific looking knife, isn't it? This was bought in barley because we didn't have anything to um, spread out or cut our fruit with. It's a horrific looking thing. But it's not very big, it's probably, you know, as long as a finger. And um, I use a whetstone. A whetstone is um, to, to keep that sharp by sort of doing that. But this simple knife is much better than the craft knives I've been using for carving foam. It just slices through it amazingly. It really makes um, very short work of getting a shape. So these things, you know, it's much better than a craft knife. I can form it, if I keep a sharp edge on it. Look at that. So you can get all sorts of great shapes, but this stuff is not good. You have to be wearing a mask when you're carving this. I've got the masks over here, so great for shaping. So this stuff is amazing, but you're not to use it without using some kind of protective device, because if it gets into your lungs, it's really very serious. So, um, Gotta hand it to you. There's those bits and pieces. What else have I got here? So that they're the knives. Oh, tweezers are very important too. Um, hand. See the tweezers for picking up fine things. Like when you're building stuff, the tweezers are great. Having a bit of trouble with the wing at the moment, just picking up fine things. Whoa, imagine this guy coming close, putting in things like eyeballs. You see, like, that eyeball's been attached or stuck into a socket. Like, that's why I've got a drilled-out socket here, but you'll never see this side of him. You'll only see the, um, you'll never see the dark side. So there he goes as he's looking around. I can imagine these guys just constantly scanning, just like that pilot in a way, constantly scanning, looking around. Amazing being in the air gives you such a power to see things. So yeah, a bit of body filler on there. You can see it as I'm shaping these characters. 
can you see how rough it is at the back? Well, you won't see the back, basically. He's got a bottom. Oh, no bare bottoms. This program includes some nudity, animals. No animals were harmed in the making of this book. So there you go. But this is the view you'll see. I'm just carving his arms out at the moment now. He's got great little legs, little power legs, go-go gadget power legs. Show you how one of those pieces starts to form. So there he goes. We'll just get him to fly away. <whistles> See you, fella. And let's have a look at those wings. The wings are made of tissue paper soaked in PVA. I'm not sure if they call it white glue. Now what will happen is his chest will get formed. Is it one of his limbs? See that being slowly carved? Best thing I can do is just show you right up there. Yeah, it's excellent. Now that goes in there. Clip over those funny wire bits, which are old coat hangers. Not that you have to use that stuff, but I just like to use what's there. See how that locks onto there? And then he's getting that arm shape, that deep chest muscle. And what I'll do is I'll use some filler to, to reform that. So we'll get some kind of view of him, and I have to fill this area in, of course. I've just got to work out the angle. So next thing I'll do is... The curvature of the wing will be rounded. I'll try and get a, this round, that round shape, just like the aerofoil. You can see it from that front bone. So I'll be forming that so he can dive off that cliff. I've got another one that's pretty good. Um, look at this. This is something I'm working on. I wonder if I pull that into shot, you can see what it is. I'm carving up something. Aircraft go places that we could just never imagine going. Not easily in any case. The lighting's not good for this. But what you might see is I'm carving out a deep sea. These are huge waves. A lot of trouble's been had lately with um, racing boats being caught at sea and these incredible races they go on. And they suddenly find themselves, especially in the Southern Ocean, in these monstrous seas that pile up. So what I'm going to have do is have a helicopter... Um, hovering up here above this boat that's in this monstrous sea and it's lost its mast already because this is what happens to these boats they become demasted it's carved out it hasn't got a keel because i need it to wedge into that ocean and i was looking at them and i was thinking they're very similar to aircraft aren't they look at its smooth shape and it's similar isn't it because it has to flow through this thick medium the water or the air these things have to flow smoothly through that medium now the trouble with them is, is they're light because they go fast. Same with planes really. But once they crash, crash down one of these waves, and that's what happens to them, they crash down those waves, um, they lose their masts. People get chucked out of them, even with harnesses. So what happens is you've got the life, you've got the lifeboat behind here in that thick sea. Can't wait to paint this ocean, I just can't wait. Thick, thick, thick sea. So there he is, launching up that wave. You can even see the bow, the bow wave coming off there. And just God knows what's going to happen to him. He goes over the top or he tumbles down or rolls. I mean, there's all sorts of possibilities there. But he's carved in there and that sea's made of foam. You can see that. It's got a lovely texture, just like water. I'll show you some of the reference I've used for this one. So this is about rescue. Once again, it's balsa wood. You can't see that here because I've smoothed it off. You can actually see it along the bottom of the hull. See that? Very coarse. Lots of body filler. Over the seas, let go, men. We're coming right up, we're coming right up again. There's the boat. Back into the ocean. Bad place to be. I keep thinking, what a bad place to be when I'm making something like that. I think, God, it's so dramatic. Anyway, yeah. Show the reference. So there's the sea. This is based on a number of pictures I've found. But I used this article here. You can see that sea. It looks flat there because they're using a long lens. But um, when you're in there, it's it's just huge. Okay, big seas. We're back into the stuff. We've got a few updates. Um, we're working on a couple of things. I was working on my first World War fighter, which is the rear view or index. It's a bit rocky. 
Um, we're working on the Birdman. I've put added a new piece to the Birdman. I've done a lot to the fighter because I've had to change things to make the filming more much easier. Now if you have a look at this, I'll share what I, last time I spoke to you I was trying to work out how to put the wing on. It was difficult because um, I had to work out a jig which is something to hold it into place while I found a way of securing the wing because it's not a whole wing and it doesn't have a support section. I added a new piece of wing. I'll bring that up to you to show you. Here it comes, I'll stay on camera. And here comes the fighter. Whoa, nose in first. <whistles> Past he goes. And that's our guy, look at that. So I've modified the rear fuselage, cleaned it up, added a new nose section. The lighting's terrible, you might see it better if I get in close there. Added a new nose section and put the top wings on. You can see the wash colour that I've used. But look at this, there's our guy. Just like he's about to be shot down. You can see that wing I was talking about. Can you see how that shows up from the correct angle? That looks just about right, doesn't it? But the wing's cut off at the end. But the struts are mounted up now, see on the front? You can see that I've mounted those struts up guns I had to add a new nose section because when I was doing my angles I figured out I'll probably be looking down there but isn't that wonderful looking down there made an engine to fit in there I'll show you the engine it's a bit harder to show you in a way but the engines just made up of bits of wood got some blue tack here let's have a look I need a nice long stick for you oh you're wondering what the heck I'm doing here Okay, here's the engine. Here it comes, the engine. Doesn't look much like an engine, does it? Well, actually, it's a lump of balsa wood. There you go. Hold it still, Kevin. With some bits of cardboard on the top. I'll show you it from the other side, though. And that's the business side. Not only is it lumps of cardboard and wood, there's also some nails stuck on it. I've used a, a piece of nail for the exhaust manifold and I've used pieces of cardboard for the cylinder heads. It doesn't matter because it'll all be spray painted black in a minute to make it fit in here. I'll put it in the plane for you, which is kind of cool because the engine, remember that bit, slips down into the um, fuselage. The engine is very important. It's a Mercedes in line six. It's one of the great aviation engines because it gave smooth power, 160 horsepower, which was quite a lot in those days. And it allowed this Albatross, which is the plane that this is, to do over 100 mile per hour, 120 mile per hour, which was fast because it had to chase things or get away from things when being chased. So that's the engine in there. And I'll paint that in a second and I'll show that to you. Notice the streamlining over the cowl. Like if you look at the front, they've tried to make sure that that engine is smoothed into the shape as much as possible. And it's a bit of a lump. And yet some of it has to be sticking out to be cool. But you notice it's got a lovely smooth shape, just like a fish. And officially this book is called Fish of the Air because that's what these things are. They flow through the air just like fish fly through the water. I'll show you the back of this because it's really quite ugly. The back of the albatross. Albatross is of course the name of a great seabird, which has nothing to do with this. Look at the back of it. You can see the chunks, you can see up through the cockpit. Let me just turn that around. See the guy sitting in the cockpit there? Might just pull it off there. It's rugged, it's rough, it's ready to go. So while the front looks quite amazing, I'll be putting in the radiator lines soon because the radiator is on top of the wing for the cooling. Now look at the back of him. There's no bottom to the pilot. There's chunks. See the engine just resting in there. See that? Fantastic. The struts are just put on a winglet there. An old piece of plywood supporting the back. It doesn't matter because what we're looking for is we're looking for the correct angle of attack, which is going to be about there. 
it's going to be sailing along like that. Just imagine that with a nice background and zoom into the guy. Whoa, look out. I'm about to be shot down. That was pretty well it. If somebody was behind you like that and they had guns that were loaded, you were pretty well gone. Because the fuel tanks were vulnerable, the pilot was vulnerable and the engine was vulnerable. So there you go, that's the update on the Albatross. I found a new way to do the second wing. You probably see it doesn't look quite right. But see, I've put a sort of a washed appearance there because I really want this to look like fabric. Yep, yeah, very cool. So made out of chunks of old wood and cardboard, guys, no problem. All right, update number two, and I'll go on with that in a minute. I'll paint those things. Update number two is our bird man. Remember this? Well, he's not a bird man, he's a pterosaur. And bones of these pterosaurs have been found in Queensland. The difficult thing is they haven't found everything, but they've found a hip bone, which is important because it identifies it as being a pterosaur. Fossils in Australia are often encased in very hard rock. But what we've done is we've added the wing fillet. I don't know if you remember, last time we had a look at the bird man, we hadn't joined that bit of wing into the body. So this piece has been added now. And if you look at the top, you can see it's been, I don't know if you can see the patch line there got some body filler in there ready to go. I've curved the wings over the top of a balloon. Let me show you that. Look, this balloon, I was trying to figure out how do I work out the curves on a wing shape like that? Have a look at it, it's extraordinary. And then I thought, I need to know what the size is. So I tried some balls, I tried a basketball. See the curve over the wing at the back? But it was too big, so I got a balloon and blew up a balloon courtesy of the RAAF Museum, oops, courtesy of the RAAF Museum, which have a wonderful museum near Melbourne. And what I did was I stretched the wing down onto the balloon and taped it all down so that what I could get is the correct curvature, like this, taped it down, and then I varnished the wings to make them hard so that it's got the correct curve. See the curve on the back? because part of flight is the curve. So it's been taped over the back of the wing and then painted, and that, when it dries, that it allows it to have the correct curve shape. See that? And that'll be good, I'll paint that soon. So that's the update there. The new piece that's gone in is this piece in here. And you can see I'm filling in there. You can see the filler up in, that, in the gap there under his arm. I've smoothed in that arm bone. See that forearm section? That's been glued in along the top. You can see the joint at the back there. Hold it nice and still, but something didn't work out. Have a look at the back of the arm. The front looks cool. This is looking fine. Look what happened at the back. Even though I'd carefully shaped that bit, look, I've got a huge gap here, but I'm going to leave it because the wing angles are all correct. So I'll be working on that new wing in a minute and we'll be going on with that. Oh, I can't wait to paint this guy. I guess as much as possible I'm going to think of seabirds because um, he's probably a sea, you know, the places they've found him suggest he might have been near the coast with high cliffs to launch himself. So that's the update on him. Some of the tools that are important, I've got to look, they break up into a number of categories. You've got sharp things and amongst that I've got a number of things, scissors for cutting things. I've got knives, you saw my kitchen knife, whoa, dun 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 dun, bit of a Hitchcock there, right here, right here, right here, right here. Craft knives, scalpels, basically I use scalpels, they're quite, I showed you those before, but I've also got something, it's an etching needle, I used to make etchings, which is scraping into steel, the best thing I can do is just show you, there you go, look how sharp that is, amazing sharp little point. Oh no, we are going to pierce his heart. No, don't try this at home. But it's sharp because it's good for piercing balsa wood. So they're the sharp things, added to which I have the drill. Drills are cool, man. They are cool. Everybody should have their own drill. Oh, 
Cool. And that has been used a hundred times already. And then we've got kind of rubby things. Rubby things are like files. I've got the, um, the wet stone to keep the tools sharp. I've got sandpaper blocks. Oh, no head here. Oh, is that a bad thing? It's probably good in my case. Sandpaper blocks. <laughs> smoothing, smoothing. Different grades of sandpaper, quite coarse. Let's see if we can get a, a grade on that. Yeah, see that? Sandpaper. That's why um, if you fall on a sandy road, you'll realise why they make sandpaper out of sand. It is very coarse. I've got much smoother stuff, oh, back here, much smoother stuff called wet and dry, which you probably realise is because you can use it both wet and dry, but that's great for smoothing, rubby things. And files, of course, files are good for, um, oh, back there, here. files are good for sort of like smoothing things off. But that's the update as it is. I want to show you my extra techno clamps. Go, go, gadget, techno clamp. I probably can't use that because there's copyright on Gadget, I bet. So um, just forget I said Gadget, and um, it's probably a good idea. Go, go, Gadget Techno Clamp. Ho, oh, ho, there you go, otherwise known as Peg for Clothes. Great for pinning things. I'll show you what sort of things I've been pinning with it. Go, go, Techno Clamp. It's great for clamping wings. Because this wing's been done as a hollow skin. That's really great in the camera, isn't it? It's, it's terrific. It's right there. Get the lighting. Ah, oh, no. See those wings starting to work out? That's about the shot. About there. I'd love to be under the wing, but I don't think I can get there. I want to see those guns under there. And that back view. And this is called rear view. I'm hoping to have this with the index or with the glossary like looking behind you there you go look we might just leave it there for the moment but that's the update engines next I think I've just dropped it <laughs> hello engine here it is engine next time I speak to you the engine will be painted Oop, you can't see it next time I speak to you the engine will be um, painted a wonderful Mercedes engine which is otherwise some old bits of wood cardboard and some nails. Easier to work on, I guess. Okay. Bye bye. There you go. There's the painted engine block from the back. That's grey primer. Still see from the bottom. See the balsa wood? Grey primer goes over the top. And what we've done is. I've just washed it down with black paint with a bit of water in it so that it kind of washes over the surfaces you can see the nails clearly the nail heads at the front and I'll show you how that sits in a vehicle see that now let's get the plane up here try and hold that as still as possible that's a good view you can see the bits now watch if I put that up to the end, put the engine up into the um, plane, you can see how that works. See that the block fits right into the engine cover. So the engine slots into there, and that's how it looks. Cam drive at the front, intake manifold, I'd called it an exhaust manifold before, it's the intake manifold of course, the one that lets the petrol and air into the engine. So that's the view you get over the side of the wing guy engine. See that? I'll show you a palette because I'm halfway through doing this. I'll show you a palette. I'll probably show you the colours that we're using here. I use big tubes of artists um, acrylic paint. Look at that. That sort of paint. I use paper. I use plastic palettes. They're just party plates. The good thing about them being is they're really good with acrylic paint. You can see all the colours I've mixed for the um, for the albatross. Over here you can see the colours for the red. I've used crimson 
and vermilion, which is an orange. And over here you might see that, oh, let's see if I can get that tone up. Is that bronze green for the wings? It's difficult because um, I needed a green that had a lot of blue in it. You might see here there's blue and the yellow to make the green with a lot of blue. And then I had to add ochre and black, isn't it funny? To get that sort of olivey tint. You might see some other stuff. I've got some whites here. This is the blue for the undersides of the wings. You try not to smear your palette up. It looks quite messy, but what I've done is I've laid the blue, the yellow, and the ochre, and then I mix them together along that surface there. I put them up the top so that the um, extra fluid drains out, so I've got a good dry run here. But that's the colours for the Albatross. Each one will have its own palette because they'll all have different colours. The engine is just done with that black. The black's washed out. See that black there? Lots of water in it to wash it out. So reduce the paint down this way. Don't mix up a whole mess of it. Okay, I'll show you the paint spot. Generally try and hold something like paint. Got my palette over here. Palette's up so I can see it. Get the black out onto the palette extra one there, wash it out, brush, I usually lean on something, like my knee, see that, I lean so it's steady, I hold it up on a stick so I can rotate it, see that rotation, and then I can put in the colour accents underneath, across the cylinder heads, I'm supporting both my hands with my knees. That'll do. Need to get into those cracks and crevices. Like that, just paint in there, nice and dark. Like that, beautiful. Wash it up. Good stuff, looks like an old Chevy engine. There you go, beautiful. Quick update on the Albatross and the Albatross, which is our first World War fighter. And um, there it is. And our jet fighter. A number of things have happened. You'll probably see that. It's got some colour on it. Two things happened. I've discarded when I finally built the albatross there's a wing here that I'd created that I've thrown away because I just couldn't get the shape I wanted I'll show you that in a second I've had some trouble finding color schemes for the MIG because it's in North Korean color scheme and um, it's difficult because you're dealing mostly with reference material especially the sort of footage that they were taking out of the aircraft that was taken in black and white and uh, of course we're having to paint these things in the correct colors so the information about the colour schemes is hard to find in some cases. But um, I had, I've had a good look at um, some reference on the internet and there's some stuff coming in off Russian sites that had a lot of information about the sort of planes that were being used. I'll show you how the engine ended up. Last time we were speaking about how to paint the engine. And there's the Albatross. Um, I've reshaped the rear fuselage to complete the uh, Maltese Cross. I'll put that wing on. I'll show you the wing that I discarded. I was going to rebuild the radiator up here, but I've decided to keep that. But have a look at this. Since I spoke to you last, I've put in a whole new nose piece in the struts. If I put some white behind there, you might be able to see the engine detail. It's hard to light, isn't it? Anyway, the engine's in there now. Gosh, it's hard to light. There you go. And get right in there and you can see the woody sort of thing you can see how the nail ended up talk about an engine being an old nail I put some a new gun barrel on the gun which is this small piece here you might notice here that small bit there is the gun barrel cylinder heads and um, the radiator the radiator connecting pipe which is made from a piece of coat hanger some access hatches, which were luckily exactly the size of a piece of paper coming out of a hole punch. See the oil streaming out of those holes? 
There he is there. I'd like to shoot it like that. That would be nice. Get him down there and up onto the wing. Yeah, he's looking good, isn't he? So roll him over. Ooh. The discarded wing. Now it's going to be hard to light. See how it's made of foam? The profile is like that, but I could not get it, I could not scoop out enough of the material because it's made of foam. So I used a lot of filler on it. You might see the difference in texture between the foam and the filler, but in any way it didn't work out. So there's a whole wing I've made that I'm not going to use, and I couldn't get the rear edge, the trailing edge it's called. The front end of a wing is called the leading edge. The rear edge is called the trailing edge. And um, I just couldn't get that fine trailing edge on it. It, was, it just didn't look right. It looked really chunky and thick. Um, the angle of attack is the way a wing approaches the airflow. If your airflow is coming from here, your angle of attack is that angle of the wing to the airflow. The higher the angle to a certain point creates greater lift. But anyway, so that's going. A fair bit of work put into that. You might see how I've been using the filler in there, filling and sanding. Doesn't matter. It's not working. Goodbye. Some research into the MIG revealed I had the pilot all wrong. I had a number of things incorrect. So uh, since I showed you the MIG last, what's changed is the pilot has new headgear. Let's get him right up there. He's got new headgear, new goggles, and a new oxygen mask, and different colours. He has a different sort of helmet. I love the way that goes right in there. So there he is there, looking around, scanning the skies as usual for any kind of trouble. The arm's out there. Let's have a look at the back of him just to see what he's made of. Blue tack balsa wood and bits of tape so let's put him in there so our pilot our Russian our Russian jet fighter who's flying for the North Koreans is sitting back in the cockpit now have a look at this this is fun because um I've had to get that angle of attack right and some of those Russian MiGs they all had these serial numbers can you see how that's, I've squished them up so that they'll look right from the front angle because that's the MIGs coming out at the angle of attack that I want, which will be something like this. Those, those figures will make more sense. I've started painting the inside of the nose. Hard to light. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint it like it's, like it's metal, but I'm not going to paint it silver. I'm actually going to use the different colours. Can you see how that works? So there he goes at you, Oof. straight over the top of us, I guess is what I'd like. The gun's got to be put in, guy's sitting in there, his head's got to be inclined so he's looking down towards the target. So that red's going in, I've masked around the words. It was interesting that the colour I mixed was eventually almost the same colour as on the albatross. Find the canopy. So the MIG with its canopy will go on like that. Well, next thing to do is make sure I fit the pilot and the canopy. There we go. Nice and clean and I'll fill in the gap. So that's looking good, isn't it? So imagine that coming at you big time, very fast. Something like that. Can't see in that cockpit, so I'm going to have to um, do something about the lighting there. Look at the wing strakes, see how they're sharply raked back? These are the wing strakes to control airflow over the wings. That's a good angle, I like that angle a lot. Colour's not working inside that nose cone yet, we'll work on that later. You can see inside that cockpit. At the front, I've cut down the size of the gun sight. The gu I built a gun sight here, cut it down in size, it didn't look quite right. There he goes like that. Okay, so that's the MIG updated. 
He's really very stubby and short, isn't he? Look at the back of him, isn't it ridiculous? He hasn't got a back of his head. There's the foam. Spin him around and that's the correct angle. Um, I just wanted to show you Kingsford Smith. So you can get him right in the camera if you'll focus. There, look. What we have now is Kevin Burgermeister as Charles Kingsford Smith. Let's get him to look up there. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, well, it's flying the Pacific, of course, is very difficult. And um, we faced all manner of difficulty. Yes. Um, because, of course, the cigarettes kept going out and, um, yeah, stuffed the compass and there you go. Burgermeister is Kingswood Smith. So that's made of plasticine and I'm going to mould off that. Right about there you get the green-headed Burgermeister. The MIG update, the canopy's in. I don't know how it's going to go with the very white surface of the thing. The canopy's been secured and um, you can see that that's been smoothed in along those edges. Looks a bit rough at the moment but I'll just finish filling that in. Polished up the canopy and that's just about ready to go. So if I hold that Yeah, that's looking the part, I think. Get the tail plane in now. I've just been drawing out the tail plane on a large sheet. I think it's going to fill that much of the shot. Like it a bit more overhead. It's quite nice.